Tonight, I wanna to talk about the coronavirus, the pandemic that has destroyed the health and livelihood of billions of people, and also the NBA. Look, I'm gonna be real. Not having basketball is turning me into a monster. Last week, I made my babies play one-on-one -on -one and the loser got written out of my will. Now, they didn't know that, but it made it so much more fun to watch. As America starts to open back up, we gotta be cautious, guys, because the next few months can't look like the last few months. Hospital workers are pleading for help, saying the lack of equipment is putting them in danger. We've got a rising death toll and historic unemployment. We still don't have enough testing available. We have shortages of masks, gowns, and gloves. Every day when I go to work, I feel like a sheep going to slaughter. Wait, that's not how it works. Americans don't die from American incompetence. People in other countries die from American incompetence. The United States is just 4% of the world's population, but has almost a third of the world's cases. And a lot of that is because of our president and how much he messed up early on. Trump got his first detailed COVID-19 briefings in January, but waited until March to do anything about it. Just look at how the virus began spreading in other countries. Now look at us. This looks like a graph of how Americans get their news. Just CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and then here's Joe Rogan. One study found that as of May 3rd, 83% of US COVID deaths could have been avoided if the White House implemented social distancing just two weeks sooner. That's about 54,000 needless deaths. So there is no question our president failed to contain this. But here's the thing. His failures exposed major problems in this country that we already knew about. Trump is exactly like coronavirus. He's bad for you, but he is way worse if you have a pre-existing condition. And there is one condition that runs through almost every problem we have seen. One of the country's top food producers is warning that the nation's food supply chain is breaking. The supply chain is a huge problem. Just getting those swabs, even getting the simple things like pipettes. The supply chain is absolutely broken. Prices for simple things like masks have gone up by 10 to 20 times. Supply chains are like your parents' marriage. You take it for granted until it's broken, and then it fucks you up for life. And that is what I want to talk about tonight. Why your dad left. I'm kidding. I want to talk about how we broke our own supply chains. Just so we're all on the same page, a supply chain is basically all of the steps to deliver a product to a consumer. Think of it like Breaking Bad. There's more or less five steps to all legal and meth enterprises. There's sourcing, AKA stealing barrels of methylamine, warehousing, where you keep the supply, manufacturing, how you made the Heisenberg blue, ideally in your undies, inventory, how much you keep on hand, and distribution, how you get it to the meth heads, RIP combo. When you put all that together, supply chains can get complicated, expensive, and usually end in the death of a Chilean chicken man named Gustavo. That's why companies are constantly trying to make their supply chains as efficient as possible. And we all know the gold standard. This Amazon fulfillment center is simply mammoth. The floor is covered in tiny QR codes. It's sort of like a chessboard. Eyes in the robot's bellies read the codes and broadcast their position. Choreography that keeps your shipment on time and avoids collisions. As gaping, gargantuan, gigantic as this fulfillment center is. Gaping, gargantuan, girthy warehouse. Dude, if you're trying to get Jeff Bezos rock hard, don't tell him how big Amazon's warehouses are. Talk about how small their unions are. But it's important to know, when you make efficiency your only goal, it comes with a big trade-off. The trade-off with efficiency is always resilience. Uh, a highly efficient system is so brittle that when you have a disruption, such as a pandemic, it starts breaking down. That's the problem. Decades of making all of our supply chains as efficient as possible left our life-saving supply chains very vulnerable, which perfectly sums up America. Everything we want is fucking amazing. iPhones, Amazon, Grubhub, everything we need is dog shit. Schools, airports, trains. Dude, I get an Uber, uh. It comes immediately. I get to Penn Station, what country am I in? It always looks like a terror attack just happened. It's dusty, people are lying on the ground, some white lady is screaming, can you help me? 
Look at our medical system. Hospitals ran out of ventilators, beds, and personal protective equipment, PPE. You saw this? Dude, doctors were wearing bandanas like Bloods and Crips. Nurses were waddling around in garbage bags. Hospitals were so desperate, they were accepting PPE from anyone. Medical shows currently on hiatus, like Grey's Anatomy and The Good Doctor, have donated their gowns and masks from their wardrobe departments. And ABC's Station 19 dropped off 300 of the coveted N95 grade medical masks that they used to wear on the show. Whoa, GMA, wrong music for a pandemic. They're like, millions of people have caught COVID fever. Grandma's coughing up blood and the body count is climbing up the charts. Mario Lopez weighs in. Also, I don't know if you caught this, she called those N95 masks coveted. There are a lot of things you should covet during a pandemic, including and especially your neighbor's wife. Go ahead, I won't tell. But no one should have to covet an N95 mask, and it shows how messed up our medical supply chains are. It's the most basic thing, fabric on your face. How did we get this so wrong? Until the coronavirus response, the H1N1 response was the largest deployment in the history of the stockpile. 85 million N95 masks were deployed from the strategic national stockpile, but guess what? They were never replenished. We didn't replace our stockpile of life-saving masks. Dude, you refilled the tank when you rent a Dodge Caravan from Hertz. But to be fair, our stockpile was never meant to be our entire supply. It was just supposed to hold us over until we fix the supply chain. But there's just one small problem. We need masks. They're made in China. We need gowns. They're made in China. We need face shields. They're made in China. We need ventilators. They're made in China. <laughs> it's just how? 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 Come on, Cuomo. You know what it is. America is made in China. China gives us everything we want, TVs, dishwashers, iPhones, for years. Chinese factory workers were jumping out of buildings so we could tweet mean things at Chrissy Teigen and have a Bolivian man deliver us pad thai. And we took the deal. And now that deal is killing us. President Bush didn't fix the problem of manufacturing like this going overseas. President Obama didn't, and neither has President Trump. Why is this so hard? It's actually not hard. We have offshored a lot of our industry for critical supplies, critical healthcare supplies, and critical medicines to save money. This is horrible, but his voice is so calming. It's like a guided meditation on trade policy. But he's right. More than 90% of our surgical masks were made overseas, so not only did we not have enough old masks, global demand was spiking, and we weren't able to manufacture enough new ones. And for people thinking, come on, bro, no one could have predicted this. Well, let me introduce you to Mike Bowen. He is the co-owner of one of the few companies that still makes N95 masks in America. How long have you been telling anyone who would listen that once a pandemic hits, that America would face a big problem? Since 2007. And for 13 years, we told, we told the story that a pandemic was going to come, the mask supply was going to collapse, and foreign health officials were going to cut off masks to the United States. And that's exactly what happened. Mike Bowen must feel so vindicated. He's been screaming about this for years, and no one was listening. It's how Alex Jones would feel if frogs ever came out of the closet. Remember, this is how unprepared we were before Trump. Then our mask supply actually collapsed. And Trump could have ramped up domestic production by invoking the Defense Production Act, or DPA. Or as Trump puts it, invoking P. No one knows what that means, but it sounds like what Benedict Cumberbatch calls sex. The DPA allows the president to take control of our supply chains during wartime or national emergencies, making private companies produce goods for the country. But for months, Trump refused to invoke it for PPE. That means while COVID was surging here, US companies kept exporting masks to other countries in March. We sent over $83 million worth of masks overseas. Some even went to China, the country we buy PPE from. That's fucking insane. It's so insane, I'm starting to sound like Trump. 
I'm like, we can't send our masks to China. America first. By the time Trump finally invoked the DPA to ramp up N95 production, it was too late. Healthcare workers were dying. Hospitals were getting price gouged and states were fighting each other and the federal government for PPE, all because Trump dragged his feet on securing medical supply chains. But what makes his inaction even more appalling is when you find out how quickly he reacted when a different industry got hammered by COVID. Across the country, many meatpacking plants have been shut down because of coronavirus outbreaks. At least 14,000 coronavirus cases tied to 181 plants. Meatpacking plants became sort of little petri dishes of, of COVID infection. Luckily, there is no evidence coronavirus is foodborne. So if you eat a lot of meat, don't worry. It's still a very safe way to get heart disease. Around the country, coronavirus outbreaks at meat plants are causing historic disruptions to supply chains. And the ripple effects came as quickly as the puns. The meat shortage across the United States has Wendy's saying, where's the beef? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? From Ohio to New York, Michigan to California, the beef shortage at Wendy's is spreading. Where's the beef? Wait, how is this only Wendy's? Burger King is just like, damn it. I guess we have to tell people Whoppers are made of whale meat and poppers. Even Costco started limiting meat to three items per person. I love how COVID forced Costco to just be normal. They're like, attention customers. During these difficult times, Costco will no longer be selling our kiddie pool of ground beef. Our deepest apologies. It got to the point. On April 26th, Tyson, America's largest meat and poultry processor, ran a full page ad in the New York Times warning of a meat shortage. And two days later, this happened. President Trump invoking the Defense Production Act to order meat processing plants to stay open to avoid a meat shortage. Wait, it took Trump two months to invoke the DPA for healthcare workers, but two days for meat? He's like, what's the point of living if we can't live moss? I get it though. Americans do not know how to handle a meat shortage. The manager explained they don't have any chicken sandwiches, that they were all sold out. Then things got way, way out of hand. One of the guys had a gun. Some of you are shocked. Most of you are like, yeah, I get it. Now, obviously, when Trump signed the executive order, he didn't say it was to stop chicken bandits. Instead, this is the reason he gave. There was a uh, bottleneck caused by this whole uh, pandemic. We unblocked some of the bottlenecks, and that whole uh, bottleneck is broken up. Okay, so what does he mean by bottleneck? This is what he means. Once the plants close down, there's nowhere to send the animals, and the animals can't just wait on the farm. The, then the farmers have to keep feeding them, which is expensive, um, and then they're not the right weight for slaughter. It's cheaper for the farmers to actually just kill the animals and put them in a mass grave than it would be for them to try to find another place for them to go. By June, Farmers are expected to euthanize almost 7 million animals because they can't be processed. So Wendy's is running out of burgers. Meanwhile, 7 million animals are going to waste. And it all comes back to meat companies and their supply chains. It breaks down like this. So you've got a lot of options when it comes to meat. A lot of brands you've seen. Some I hope you never see. Like Roomba Meats, which I assume is meat that a robot vacuumed off the floor or a brand called Not So Sloppy Joe, which sounds like the boyfriend you've settled for during quarantine. But all these brands are actually just subsidiaries of six companies, Tyson, Cargill, Smithfield, National Beef, Hormel, and JBS. These companies account for nearly two thirds of all meat and poultry sales in the United States. Since the, the Reagan administration, we essentially allowed uh, meat companies to merge in the name of efficiency. Uh, we found that uh, bigger meat companies could slaughter more animals and produce meat more cheaply. So you get to this situation where if a single pig processing plant closes down, um, uh, all, the, all the pigs destined for that plant have nowhere to go. It's a, really a, a tale of efficiency gone mad. Corporate consolidation has made these companies the only game in town, which is great for them. They set the prices, they set the rules, and they set the speed on the processing line. And that is the whole ball game. Now you've probably noticed just how closely some of these workers are to one another. The reason for that is largely to allow the production line to move faster, 
the pace of the line goes so fast that workers rarely have time to go to the bathroom. Got it. So the next time you get E. coli from Jack in the Box, just remember, you're shitting for two people. This isn't just a part of their business model. It is their business model. Efficiency depends on workers being packed on the line. Meat plants were basically destined to become COVID hotspots. They're cold, windy, with tons of people packed like sardines for hours, and COVID showed up like a dictator visiting the White House, happy, comfortable, and ready to start killing. And because of this model, how do you think companies were handling social distancing? Our first glimpse inside a meatpacking plant, workers crowded shoulder to shoulder at a Georgia's poultry plant in Arkansas, packed in those hallways, masks down, with apparently no place inside to socially distance. <sighs> that is inhumane. A vertical video? Get that out of my sight. As more workers caught COVID, shit got even worse. Here's how JBS handled an outbreak at a plant in Colorado. JBS management stopped testing shortly after it started, well before its promise to test employees. Insiders reporting between 40 and 80% of JBS supervisors and managers tested positive on that initial day of testing. They don't want the numbers to come out. It's, it's bad PR. Hey, JBS, if you don't want bad PR, maybe you don't have higher fatality rates than Jurassic Park. Normally, companies like JBS have no problem keeping things under wraps. That's because they hire some of the most vulnerable people in America. More than half of their employees are refugees or immigrants, many of them undocumented. But COVID is making things so bad even they're speaking out. Michael is an immigrant, and he says he didn't ask questions. It was after his last shift on April 10th that Michael says he started to feel ill. At that point, my, uh, my face mask was getting wet all the time, so I had to pull it off and just stay without it. I was struggling, so I was breathing so hard and getting close to the other guys, and I was like, okay, I might be getting sick. That guy, Michael, works at a Smithfield plant in South Dakota where there was a huge outbreak. 853 employees got sick and two died. By April 15th, 55% of all COVID cases in the whole state could be traced back to that one plant. It's like the Genghis Khan of fucking vulnerable people. So basically, Genghis Khan. If you're wondering, how are these companies getting away with this? It all comes back to Trump and the Defense Production Act. Remember, he signed an executive order keeping meatpacking plants open. But here's the thing, we actually read the order and it doesn't say anything about making meat plants stay open. It just encourages plants to follow federal safety guidelines and prioritize federal contracts. That's it. But that's not how it was reported. His new order will force processing plants to stay open. Ordering meat processing plants to stay open. Ordered the meat plants open. Mandating they stay open. Requiring meat plants to stay open. Wait, no, you're reporting on the fine print, but you never read the fine print. You're acting like a WhatsApp thread with commercial breaks. What's actually happening here is more insidious. Trump said he was invoking the DPA to help with the bottleneck, right? But listen to him on the day he signed it and see if a certain word stands out. We're gonna sign an executive order today, I believe and uh, that'll solve uh, any liability problems where they had certain liability problems and uh, we'll be in very good shape. We're working with Tyson, which is one of the big companies in that world. It was a very unique circumstance because of liability. Fun fact, liability also happens to be the Secret Service code name for Eric. Trump is invoking the DPA to shield meat plants from liability from their workers. He's not forcing them to stay open. He's giving them cover to stay open so the plants can avoid liability. And that's exactly what's happening. Just look at Smithfield Foods, the company that Michael works for. A Smithfield plant in Nebraska told workers they were shutting down on April 27th. The next day, Trump signs the executive order and within hours, the plant says it's staying open. And liability doesn't seem to be a concern. In April, a workers group sued a Smithfield plant in Missouri for endangering employees due to COVID. Smithfield then tried to get the case thrown out based on Trump's executive order. And it worked. The judge threw out the lawsuit, screwing over the workers. So just to put it in Trump terms, invoking P was BS, but now it's effing the W's. And this affects all of us. 
Look at this graph of COVID cases in the food industry. Right after Trump signed the executive order, cases spiked at almost twice the national rate and spread like crazy. By May 15th, of the 25 counties with the highest infection rates, almost half of these outbreaks started in meat factories. Here's the most ironic thing about all of this. Trump says he feels like a wartime president, but the way he has used his powers shows you exactly where his priorities are. The Defense Production Act is so the president can take control of supply chains to force corporations to protect the public. But Trump is using it to protect corporations at the expense of the public. So it's great that Trump feels like a wartime president. I just wish he would actually be one. Because real wartime presidents care about the front lines, not the bottom line.